Okay, so um, I've already mentioned and explained a little bit correlation uh, throughout the introduction and I've mentioned it a couple of times. Uh, basically, instead of doing something on a, a scheduled basis or relying on people to pick up on something, we have our correlation engine to make smart decisions and to help you out uh, triggering on certain events and certain conditions happening in your system and reacting on that. So I'll give you a little bit of an introduction. I'll explain the concepts just theoretically, you could say, and then we'll go in the correlation app to apply that theoretical approach in the uh, actual UI and how we can define a so-called correlation rule in there. We'll do some exercise on that as well. And then we'll uh, so show you also the root cause analysis uh, that uh, is part of the uh, correlation engine, uh, basically uh, defining the whole RCA chain there of devices so that you can, in the alarm console, see the RCA level. Remember from the uh, alarming, we had some RCA level 0, 1, 2, 3, the distance to the most probable root cause. We, did we will define a device connectivity chain in here. And I'll show you some uh, aggregation there. I briefly mentioned that already, so uh, we'll be able to be quite short on that. Where is correlation located? Uh, you will find it in the apps. Um, so uh, in the surveyor on the apps tab page, you have uh, on there the automation and the uh, correlation uh, section there. Um, there on the right hand side. So as I said, um, correlation will be able to detect certain conditions. So it will basically ingest information from your system. The most typical thing is it will uh, ingest alarm information. Alarm information, that's the most important thing that basically you will use as a trigger. So it's continuously looking at your system and it's ingesting all the alarms and you are able to say like, oh, if this and this and this is happening in my system, you need to react. And the correlation engine will say, oh, this is happening now, so I need to do something. You can then do something by executing an automation script to try to fix the problem, or maybe just group the alarms so that the operator doesn't have like 10 different alarms, but had like one nice meaningful alarm. So you can generate a new alarm, uh, try to fix the problem, maybe send an email report. So you can do any kind of action event-based. That's what the correlation rule is about, uh, triggering on certain events in your system and immediately react on that. You don't have to wait for a human being to react on those things. So the concept, I'll explain you a little bit how it works. So basically we will have an, uh, a, a database, you could say, with correlation rules. So we as a user will populate that database with so-called correlation rules. And the correlation rule, we will also create some in, the, uh, in an example, will then make sure that uh, all the alarms coming in on the on the left hand side there all the alarms are coming in we can check real time values as well and based on what we defined in the knowledge base it will do certain actions so on the right hand side we can see we can change a parameter uh, generate a new alarm and uh, op uh, execute an automation script also sending an email as possible these kind of things so we have basically an when it needs to happen and a what needs to happen. So that is what a correlation rule is about. It's a when it needs to happen and what needs to happen at that point in time. So it consists out of two things, uh, a so-called uh, trigger, the when, and an action, the what. That's very simple, simply said what a correlation rule is. So we will need to define two things in there. Let's have a little bit of a closer look at a trigger and, an, uh, and the actions. So in a trigger, we will define a so-called event and a mechanism. An event, let's just call it to be simply, uh, to be simple, a filter. If a critical alarm happens on my Philips device, that's what I can define in there. So you can compare it pretty much with uh, a filter. So that's gonna be an, uh, an event that we specify there in the trigger. And we typically also combine it with a mechanism. What is a mechanism? Well, 
maybe I don't just want to uh, filter only, I want to do certain recurring behavior. But let's first take a look that, uh, to an event. I said it's a filter. Yes, it's a filter. That's the most basic form. It is a bunch of alarms coming in on the upper side there, and we basically filter. And I could be happy with that. And I could say, okay, that's my, uh, that's my event. I just filter. I take in critical alarms from my flips device and I react on that. So that's the most simple form of an event. But we can take it a step further and we can also do so-called alarm grouping. Why is that? Well, um, let's say I want to create a correlation rule that uh, triggers if there are three um, critical alarms on my Philips device, I want to do something. So um, basically I create if a critical alarm happens on element BERT IRD main. Yeah, and now I want to create that, uh, and now I want to do the same correlation for all your devices. I'm not going to create uh, 20, 30 correlation rules. So I don't want to specify in my filter if a critical alarm happens on my Philips device. I want to say if it happens on any Philips device in my training view, maybe. But then what is the problem if there are three, if an alarm happens on mine and on your device and on your device, we already have three and it will execute. No, what I want to do is I want to do grouping. I want to create buckets and you can actually activate alarm grouping and say, I want to group by, for instance, element buckets. And I want to create where all the filtering is happening. I don't want to put all after the filtering, all the alarms on one pile. I want to put them in separate piles of alarms grouped by elements. And whenever I have, uh, for instance, uh, three alarms in one bucket there, I want to do something. So if this element reaches three, it will do something. This is not yet uh, reaching three and this one is also not yet reaching three so it won't execute yet if i wouldn't do the grouping i would have one big bucket where everything is in there and i would already have like uh seven uh, alarms in there and it would immediately execute as soon as i have three alarms of any device i'll show that with some examples uh, uh, on some exercises as well on how exactly that works but it is made to really make your correlation rule more generic. Instead of doing everything in the filter and creating 20 different, 20 different correlation rules, I'll be able to create one correlation rule and basically use that grouping feature. So that grouping feature will help us a lot by making generic uh, correlation rules uh, in there. Grouping by element, for instance, we'll use that in our exercise. And there is also a condition you can apply. You can say in that bucket, or that one big bucket or in those three buckets, you can add an additional condition, like I already mentioned, are there three alarms in my bucket? So that's a simple um, condition you can add in here. It will say, are there three alarms in that bucket? Ah, yes, there are. So I will execute my actions. This one didn't reach three and this one didn't reach three as well. So those ones are still waiting for new alarms to come in. As soon as there are three alarms in that bucket, it will also execute. So that's an additional condition you add in your bucket. If I would not specify a condition, it would mean as soon as an alarm gets through my filter, arrives in the bucket, it would immediately execute. So the most simple form is just filtering and then immediately if something gets through, it will execute. The next step I can do, I can split it up in different buckets per element or per view, for instance, and I can even add an additional condition on that specific bucket there. That will come back in the UI. We'll go through it again in the UI and we'll do it in an exercise as well step by step, do the most simple form first, and then further enhance it with the grouping and the rule conditions. So an event is very simply set a filter, but it can be a little bit more. Next to that event, I also have a mechanism that I specified. 
What is that mechanism? Well, we have three types of mechanisms. The first one is the, the most simple one. It's just the default. It will immediately execute. Whenever something arrives in my buckets and the condition is met, it will execute my um, actions. Very simple. Something gets through, it's being executed. Yeah, but maybe you want, uh, so uh, to, just to be uh, sure uh, that uh, the, the drawing is clear here, uh, you have an event that occurs, that's uh, the green arrow, and the red arrow is that the trigger goes off. Actually here, the green arrow is behind the red arrow. So that's why you only see the red arrow. As soon as the green arrow appears, at the same moment in time, it is being executed to your actions. The second one is a persistence. It basically says, if something happens and it clears after a few seconds, we didn't react on it. We only react if the condition comes up and it stays in my system for a longer time. So I say, maybe for instance, if I'm running on a power supply, uh, on a UPS, um, not on a power supply, but on a battery. Um, if I'm running on a, on a UPS, I'm not really worried yet. And I generate a warning alarm. But if I'm there for like 15 minutes, I start to worry. So then I can basically pick up and the warning alarm that I'm running on the UPS is a little bit too long in my system and I can pick up on that and I can make a critical alarm or I can send an email or send a text message or I do certain actions to make sure that somebody uh, wakes up to help and resolve this, uh, uh, this uh, problem. Here. So a pers persistent one is uh, a condition or a situation that is happening for a longer time in your system and you want to react on it. Not immediately. If it's only a short period of time, I don't worry. If it's too long, then I react on it. The last one is a recurring event. A recurring event means if I have only now and then a problem, I don't react on it. But it, if all of a sudden I have a burst and I have a small of, I have a large number of events happening in a short period, then I want to react on it and I want to generate, for instance, an alarm. So if I, if I have a signal coming in and now and then it generates an error message, I don't really worry. Once in a while, maybe I allow one error per 10 minutes or something. But if all of a sudden I have like 20 errors in one minute, then it's getting a little bit worse, my signal. And I want to pick up on that. So that's a typical example where you say a recurring problem. Now and then a small error message uh, or an error on my signal is not that bad. But if it happens too often in a short period of time, then I want to trigger on that. So that's a recurring event um, where it happens too often in a short period of time. So those three mechanisms I can uh, specify. We'll see that also in the UI. So as I said, an event is a little bit like an alarm filter, but you can do a little bit more with the grouping and the conditions. We defined a mechanism. The most simple thing is immediately. You could also go for persistent or recurring. And then on the right hand side, we define what needs to be executed. So you can uh, run an automation script, generate a new alarm, do a single set of a parameter, or maybe just send an email. So you have several actions and you can combine actions as well. We'll see that in the UI uh, when we get there. So that's simply when and what. That's a correlation. Now let's apply that to our UI and let's take a look on how we will be able to configure and create a correlation rule. So we'll dive into the correlation app. In the correlation app, as I said, uh, you can find that by uh, going to your surveyor. Let me open it on our system as well. So if we scroll down or collapse that one, we have our correlation there. Basically, you see on the left hand side a uh, number of folders. So you can organize that a little bit. Uh, maybe to keep it a little bit organized, I'll immediately create a new folder training. And let's uh, do a little bit of a, a trick, a, 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 training. Then it will be on top. No, it's not on top. That's zero, yeah? 
No, that was not silly. So doesn't really matter. Um, so we have our training folder, and in there you can then create a new rule. I'll immediately do that with an example as well, then, or an exercise uh, where we will have, of course, our training underscore Bert V A. Let's apply that. I just want to show you. Um, like we have in UI, so uh, we will have uh, take a look at uh, the folder structure, of course. And then we have here the same things as we will just saw in our introduction. And here it's a little bit in the slide nicely uh, indicated. The first thing we have there on top is the event. Very simply, as I said during the, the, the theory, uh, we have our alarm filter. So that's the bare minimum I typically do. I can combine it with alarm grouping as well. And I can optionally also add some rule condition on there. So those are the three things that we specified in our event. Optionally, we can combine uh, instead of, or instead of doing the standard immediate evaluation, we can go for a persistent or a recurring window. I'll, there's some more things there. And then at the bottom, we define actions. You can add actions and you can add multiple actions and generate more things in there. Just we'll see that you can add uh, more than one action in there. So that's what a correlation rule is. When, some mechanism, and what needs to be done. We'll do that step by step in an exercise as well. First, let's take a quick look at the, 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 the folder structure. So as I said, a little bit like in the file explorer, you can create some folders in there. There are some uh, buttons uh, at the bottom to create a new folder in there immediately and to add a new rule in there. Uh, delete some uh, and some more actions. Oh. This pointer is doing a little bit weird. You can also use the right click menu to uh, create a new folder to duplicate, uh, etc. I already created a new folder so that we can keep it organized in there and added a new uh, rule in there. Note, you can also move uh, folders with drag and drop in there um, so you can uh, play around with that. A small side note and system display, you had other correlation rules, so that's why we also have that uh, advanced in there with the old engine, uh, but we don't really need to worry about that. That's for backwards compatibility. Now, um, if we added a folder uh, or a correlation rule uh, in our folder, uh, let's take a look on uh, the different uh, things we have to start with as the general section on top of your correlation uh, rule. So I created a new rule and I gave it a name, but there are some, some, uh, there are some details here. So we're talking about this first details panel uh, in here. Um, so as always, we give it a name, but maybe something I need to uh, specify first is um, we have that enable rule checkbox there. And that's an important one. Because if you create a new correlation rule, it is not activated by default. It's not enabled by default. So if you ever create a correlation rule and it doesn't work, maybe check if it's enabled. <laughs> Why do we uh, put it by default disabled? It's just if I'm busy creating my correlation rule, I created one, I already clicked on apply to save it, it would already start doing things, you could say. As soon as I start an action, I didn't specify any filter yet, so it takes in everything now. So now it's taking reacting on everything because I didn't specify a filter. So as soon as I would add an action, click on apply, it would start doing everything. So you first nicely configure everything, then we enable our correlation rule. Um, the, uh, the name, the description, that's clear, of course. Accept correlation alarms. A first checkbox that is by default disabled, and we, add, we, we strongly recommend to leave it disabled unless you know very much or very good what you are doing. What's the problem by activating this checkbox? 
Um, except in correlation uh, alarms, normally it ingests only device alarms. So you say, if a critical alarm happens on my Philips device, and if your action is generating a critical alarm on your Philips device, you're creating a correlated critical alarm. If normally it won't accept the correlated alarm you uh, generate as input. If you enable this checkbox and you generate a critical alarm on your Philips device, it will again come in and it will say, oh, there's another critical alarm on my Philips device. Let's generate another one. And, oh, there's another one. And it goes in a nice loop. And then you can like test how many, how many alarms DataMire can generate with the correlation engine. That's a little bit of a stress test, you could say. So typically, you need to be very careful if you want to trigger on correlation alarms that you make sure that you're not generating input for your own rule and doing a loop. So by default, we don't listen to the correlation alarms. Same thing for information events. Typically, we're looking at real alarms coming from the equipment. Uh, you could also trigger on, for instance, somebody logging in. If your boss is logging in, you immediately get a text message that you need to start cleaning up some things. So you can uh, trigger on any audit trailing that happens on any event, somebody logging in, somebody changing a value, changing a, a, a visual file, whatever, every automate, uh, information event you can trigger on. But by default, we are typically not so much interested in that, so we don't ingest that. If you want to do that, you have to specifically uh, enable it over there. Normally, um, every data miner agent in the data miner system will look at the conditions and it will uh, react on it. So like our uh, example where I say if a critical alarm happens on uh, a Philips device, every data miner agent, if we have 10 data miner agents, would independently do that. You are able to actually say, well, actually, I want one data miner agent to manage the rule and one server is going to basically uh, do the correlation uh, rule triggering. So uh, that's more to do cross DMS uh, things. You can uh, force it uh, like that so that you don't, don't generate more than one um, alarm, for instance. That's a little bit more special. Uh, it's also explained in here. Now, that was the details section. Underneath it, we immediately start with when. The most simple form, as I said, is a filter. And that's going to be our first um, example as well, our first exercise. Very simple. If a critical alarm happens on my element, for instance. So here it's a major and it's another device. Yeah, there's some other condition here. Um, so that's the most simple thing, and we're already happy with that. That's going to be our first example that we will do our first exercise. Normally, if an alarm updates, you have like the whole life cycle of an alarm. Uh, that's the tree of an alarm, uh, the tree status. You can actually say that it needs to trigger on every update, and then it would do multiple actions if my alarms are updating. Uh, by default, you don't really do that, so you can leave that disabled uh, for now. Um, we're doing a little jump to the to the very bottom, um, where we are able to, uh, in the actions, also add an option in here, limit uh, the base alarms. That's a special one. I just want to mention here. Um, I'll delete it again. So I added this option. What what does it say? It's also on the slide, so it's going to be bigger there. What does it say? Well, uh, it's a little bit of a special thing. If I generate an alarm, it will include all the alarms generated X amount of time, like let's say one minute, before and after the moment this rule was triggered. That's to make your correlation rule a little bit, um, how should I say, um, wider and you're not really precisely knowing what is going to happen, so you're not able to do it in the filtering. But yet again, you know, if this condition is happening, 
some alarms are happening before and after that event, and I want to group everything together. So it's not defined in your filtering. You just say, if my Philips device goes into alarm, you just need to take all the alarms that are happening one minute before and one minute after the alarm and group it together into that single event. So that's to do a little bit a rough grouping, you could say, because you're not doing it with exact filtering there, uh, but you know that certain things are happening. So that's a, an, an extra option uh, where you can uh, enable that uh, grouping in time, you could say. We're not going to do that. Uh, we're going to do exact uh, filtering. I define the filter. That will be, will be my first uh, exercise. But as I said, I want to make it for every Philips device. So therefore, I can do grouping. I can make those buckets. The most frequently and easy one is basically grouping on elements. So you see that's the one is, that is highlighted. You can also group, for instance, by view. Could also be interesting. Uh, if you have like... Uh, 1,000 transmitter sites, and you want to make a correlation rule for a transmitter site, you don't want to say, if site 1, I have 5 criticals, do something. If site 2, if I have 5 criticals, do something, and do that like a 1,000 times. No, you will say, if I have 5 critical alarms grouped by view. So creating a bucket per site, basically. So that was uh, is something I will do as an enhancement on my initial exercise to group by elements. You can actually also group by multiple items uh, as well. That's taking it a step further. I did my filtering. I will add some grouping, some buckets. I create buckets per element. The next thing I can do is I can also add a rule condition. I can look in my buckets if it matches a certain condition. I always use the example, which is not in the slide here, uh, if the count is three. If there are three items in my buckets, I do something. In this case, it does, an, uh, well, you actually have two types of conditions. I'm talking about the script condition first here. Uh, the script condition here is a little bit more a complex one. Um, I will use in my exercise uh, if the count of the star of everything is 3. In this case, it says the average of the field value. Uh, so an alarm has a value like 18. It generated an alarm at 18. Uh, so if the average of the value field is less than 1.3. So in this case, it's taking a look like if I have, for instance, on a ro remote site, a bunch of uh, satellite receivers and the EPNO all goes into alarm, I'll take a look and I say if the average of my EPNO is less than 1.3, then I know that probably there's some rain fade because uh, they suddenly all have bad reception. So um, that's a uh, script condition on a value filter. That's a script condition. Where can you find those uh, script conditions? Well, you need to go to the help and uh, see some more details about that. So you can go to the data miner help. And let's see if I search for script condition examples of script conditions so you already have some examples here so we are in the left hand side uh, the uh, correlation rule syntax with the script condition functions uh, so here you can see all the fields you have the properties the parameters the counts here is my count star uh, the min a max an average around and then you can see some examples uh, i'm going to be using count star uh, equals three or greater than two, uh, something like that. And some other examples are in there as well. So those are script conditions. A condition, a script condition on my bucket. What can you also do? You can also do a filter 
condition, a filter condition. We already did filtering. That's where it gets confusing now. Because I did filtering, I put them in buckets or maybe just one big bucket. Uh, so I'm doing filtering and again, I'm doing filtering. Why is that? Well, actually, um, what it is, is um, let me give you a practical example. Let's say I filter on um, major alarms and critical alarms of my Philips device. So a major happens, it gets into to the buckets. And another major happens, it gets into the buckets. And yeah, actually, I don't want to start doing my actions as soon as I have a critical alarm in my bucket. So all the majors are getting into my bucket. Nothing happens unless my, my bucket matches a certain filter. For instance, a critical needs to be in there. So that's why you can do here uh, yet another uh, filtering and say severity equal to critical. What is the big difference? You could say, well, do the filtering on top. Yeah, but then only the criticals get into my bucket. And when the alarm gets generated, you just have a correlated alarm with the critical underneath it. But I also want the majors underneath there. So if I want to have the majors in my grouped alarm, I need to allow those majors in my top filter. So the majors get through and the criticals get through, but I only want to trigger as soon as I have a critical in my bucket. So here, it's not about filtering what needs to, what gets into your bucket. It is when it needs to execute your action. So my bucket fills up with all the majors. And as soon as a critical gets in there, oh, severity, severity is critical. We execute our action and we have an alarm in the alarm console for the operator. And I open it up. I see the critical and all the majors in there. So that's the subtle difference. The filtering on top is what gets into your bucket, well, what will be grouped together. And this filter is when it needs to trigger. As soon as my bucket contains a critical, I do something with all the alarms. I'll do an example on uh, some adding some rule condition in there as well. Now, the triggering mechanism, as I said, by default, the most simple one is immediate evaluation. So meaning as soon as I uh, have my uh, conditions met, I do something. That's the most typical one as well. You can also go for persistent, uh, meaning that it needs to be, uh, the condition remains fulfilled for 30 seconds, one minute, one hour. So if I'm running on my UPS for 15 minutes, I take action and I wake some, somebody up by sending a text message. Yeah, you can also do a collecting of the um, events for one minute uh, after the first event and then evaluate. That's a little bit of a delay uh, that you can specify. So not immediately trigger, but wait if it still uh, happens after one minute and then or still uh, is the case. So that's a little bit a subtle difference there. The recurring uh, is here. We call it yeah, not recurring, but sliding window. And here it says if the situation happens like, let's say 20 times in one minute, then I want to do something. So now and then an error on my signal is not a problem. But as soon as I have 20 errors in one minute, then I pick up on that. Actually, you can make it a little bit more uh, complex by enabling also this checkbox. And this checkbox says that the above must happen for like 10 minutes. What is the difference? Well, um, if I take 20 alarms in one minute, okay, but maybe I want to take a, lo take a look at it for a longer period of time. So I want to take a look at it, not to one minute, but to 10 minutes. Okay, so I can say if within 10 minutes, 200 alarms are happening. Yes, you can do that. But actually, I don't want to trigger if 200 alarms happen in the first minute. Then it would also trigger. So here you can actually say if it happens 20 times in one minute, and this needs to happen for 10 consecutive minutes. The first minute, I need to have 20 alarms. The second minute, I need to have 20 alarms. 
the third minute I need to have 20 alarms. And if that remains like that, if that spread, that loads of continuously having some errors, many errors in a short period of time, if that happens for 10 minutes after each other, then I do something. So that's just to avoid that you trigger on one burst of alarms. If you only have one burst, then you say like, okay, if it's a single event, uh, it's gonna, it's gonna be over. Um, but if that burst continues to happen, the first minute, the second minute, the third minute, the f up to 10 minutes, then I do something. So that's different than specifying 200 alarms in 10 minutes. You can also specify 20 alarms in one minute and say that it must remain uh, there for 10 minutes. It's the same amount of alarms, but you force it to be spread over uh, a longer period of time. And not just trigger on one burst of 200 alarms in the first 10 seconds, because then it will immediately execute if you only ex activate the first one. Okay. Now adding an action, um, as I said, you can add multiple actions. Um, we're not going to be able to add an automation script yet because that's coming up in the next module. But uh, if you click on that add action, you will see the, the different possibilities uh, you have. Um, you can acknowledge the, the base alarm. So the base alarm is, is the triggering alarm, the, the, the raw alarm on the device that is uh, causing uh, your event to uh, trigger. You can also escalate the existing alarm to a higher severity. Uh, a typical one is uh, generating a brand new alarm because on a remote site, all the receivers go into alarm. So you generate a new alarm that says, oh, that's a possible rain fate. And underneath it, you have the five receiver alarms uh, of that uh, site. That's the example I already uh, showed you uh, earlier on. Earlier on. Um, sending, uh, running a script, that's going to be for the next module uh, script, uh, automation script. Sending an email, sending a text message, and uh, also a single set is possible. Um, if you only want to change one parameter, that's uh, what I will do in an uh, example as well. You can just rely on a single set uh, in here. As I said, you can add multiple actions in there. Uh, that's uh, something you can just combine. So in here, we have added uh, two actions. We have done an uh, escalate event and a an, uh, sending of an email. You can change the order and you can delete some actions uh, again as well. Now, uh, taking a, a look a little bit to uh, what we have as options as well. If you acknowledge an alarm, you can add some uh, comments. If we escalate an event, we can do an auto clear. What is auto clear? Um, you have a little bit the choice. If the correlation engine generates an alarm, if it detects a condition, that's going to come back with all the alarms. Um, do you want, if the condition no longer occurs, do you want to clear the alarm as well? For instance, if I detect that rain fade on that remote site, all my receivers go into alarm. I generate an alarm because my five receivers go into alarm with all the alarms underneath there. Possible rain fade. The alarm stays there. If I leave this unchecked, the alarm would remain there forever until an operator says like, oh, data might detected a possible rain fade. Let's check it out. And he can right click on it and clear. If you enable the auto clear, then as soon as your receivers have a good signal again, the condition is no longer met, we will automatically clear the alarm. So with a possible rain fade, an auto clear might make sense because the alarm can be taken away again uh, automatically. Certain conditions, you might want to have that alarm staying in your alarm console forever until somebody picks up on that and clears it manually by right clicking on it. So that's that auto clear that will come back with all the alarm generation in the um, correlation rule. So you can escalate the existing event. Um, you can generate a brand new correlated alarm. 
uh, if you go for a new alarm event, you need to specify it on a certain data mar a uh, on not a certain data mar agent. This is confusing here. On a certain element, a certain total processor load, a parameter that is with a certain value and a certain severity. So an alarm, you basically need to specify all the columns of your alarm console. So if an alarm is happening, you need to specify what needs to be in the element column, in the parameter column, and in the value column. By default, uh, you can also take something like base alarm severity, so the, the severity from the originating alarm, uh, that is possible as well. We'll generate an alarm uh, and play with that as well. I already mentioned that um, auto clear, so the auto clear is uh, enabled here by default. Uh, you can also, I believe that's in here as well, uh, include the name in the alarm, uh, in the alarm value. Uh, that's just um, the value of the alarm is like possible rain fade. If you enable this checkbox, it will add behind it between brackets the name of your correlation rule. It's just if you see some alarms happening that you know which correlation rule is actually triggering uh, or generating that uh, alarm. It's just to find back the uh, correlation rule. Update base alarms. Uh, that's the base alarms will be updated after the correlated alarm has been uh, generated. So the base alarms are the raw alarms that are being generated. Uh, so that will uh, each time be updated. Normally you want it to be updated, so that's good. Evaluate value is a little bit of a special case uh, because um, actually inside my value, like if I go back, uh, if I specify there a uh, alarm value and I type in there, uh, watch out possible rain fate detected. If you type that in that alarm value, Maybe you want to extend it with some more information coming from the uh, base raw alarms. Same thing as the script condition that we just saw. Here you can take the average of the field value. So you can use that same script condition again and you can say, well, if I have my five receivers on that, uh, on that remote site going into an alarm, I want to indicate their possible rain fate and show the average EPNO so that you immediately have an idea what the average is of all the EPNOs, the receive levels, uh, whatever you want in there from those base alarms, that group of alarms. If you want to do something like this and the value average value is between square brackets, you can specify that. If you add something like this, you need to make sure you enable that option, uh, evaluate your uh, value, because otherwise the text won't be replaced by the actual average. We only do the text parsing if you enable that checkbox for performance reasons. The root time of the base alarm, um, that basically your uh, root time of your um, Correlated alarm that is being generated is one of those base alarms. If I have five alarms, the first one uh, was generated at 8 o'clock this morning, then one at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock, etc. If I uh, generate my alarm at 11 o'clock, you can have the root time of your uh, base alarm, of your uh, correlated alarm on the first, basically the first originating alarm there. So if you want to have that original time in there, you have the possibility as well. Running an automation script, that's going to be for the next uh, module. So uh, I'm not going to focus on that one. You can run a script and have some uh, options on there as well. But uh, we'll take a look at automation later on. Sending an email. If my device goes into alarm, send me an email with optionally a report on that. So you can immediately send an email to somebody. Oh, my name is there. And then you can immediately include the report as well that we created yesterday. Actually, by the way, I received that email uh, yesterday. Uh, I, I received it during the session. It was not that late, but uh, um, I can still show you later on. So you can detect the problem and send an email or a report as well. So I mentioned that you can send email reports schedule based every morning at eight o'clock 
but also event-based you can do it. If something happens, if there's a, if there's a rain fade of the, on the remote side, send me an email report. All these kind of things you can do. Sending a text message, if you have the mobile gateway and an industrial cell phone attached to your data mire agent, you can also send a text message event-based. We will use this single set parameter instead of creating an automation script, which we still need to cover in the next module. Uh, we will um, use a single set. We detect the problem and we automatically try to react it by putting it back on a good value. Again, you can also here execute on clear. What is that? Whenever we detect the problem, the condition, the situation, we will execute that set. But you can also execute it when you clear on the clear. So that's why uh, the on clear is also in there. And execute when base alarms are updated. Basically, if new uh, base alarms are com coming in, you can also execute there. And evaluate the value if that would be necessary. Now, let's do a little bit of exercise to get a little bit back in uh, our mind on one uh, row there. We will uh, pick it up again in the UI and do a little bit again the things that we've seen uh, so far. After this, uh, we just have some more uh, things with the uh, RCA and also an analyzer. So we already saw uh, the big chunk of uh, theory here. So what I will do is I will create a um, new correlation rule in the folder training with the name training underscore my first name as always. What I will do is I will specify a filter. My first thing will be specifying a filter so that the rule only triggers on a critical alarm of the audio output level of your personal Philips device. And maybe you need to make sure that you're not doing it on any Philips device, but your personal Philips device to keep it narrow and don't uh, generate on everything uh, because you might need to generate too many lives there. We'll go for immediate evaluation. We don't do any grouping for now. Um, and what we will do is we will generate a new alarm with uh, the value uh, trying to fix the problem. And we will also try to correct the situation by setting the audio output level back to 6. So basically, we know that this Philips device, sometimes it's like drifting away and the audio output level gets to a bad value. And each time, yeah, the operators, they need to go in there and, and fix it again. So I want, to, I want to automate that. And I want to detect this problem by saying whenever a critical alarm happens, warn somebody that you're trying to fix the problem. Maybe they still need to further investigate it, but they immediately react by setting it back to six. Okay, let's uh, try that out. And uh, let's, uh, yeah, a small note is that um, you are not able to enable your rule unless you have at least one action and one filter or condition or option uh, on single events, but we're gonna go for a filter and an action. Okay, there we have our, uh, so just to be sure, so we are here in uh, our uh, data miner system. You go to apps, correlation. I created that uh, folder there, the first folder uh, training. I already uh, right clicked on that folder and say new rule. Uh, so you can create a new rule as well. Um, you specify your name, training underscore your login. And you can already at the bottom right hand side, click on the apply. Let me make that a little bit higher. Click on the apply to make sure that it's already saved for the first time. Remember, it is not enabled by default. So you can see all our correlation rules are a little bit grayed out while uh, other uh, are uh, in like a, a black font when they are enabled. Okay, uh, show details. Uh, we're not gonna do anything fancy with correlation alarms and creating loops or um, doing some uh, information triggering. We will just add a plain simple filter and the first thing I will filter on is severity. 
and it needs to be critical. So same filter uh, editor as we have already seen uh, a couple of times. Eh? It says filter on a critical alarm on your personal Philips device. Okay, so add uh, a second item, add filter item element equal to that IRD main. So your name, of course, your first name. The main or the backup you can choose. Okay. And actually, it says on uh, my audio output level. Not that hard of a requirement, but I just want to show you there that parameter description. If you go for parameter description, you can go by element or by protocol that I explained that to you, that was the same thing. It's just the approach to get to the audio output level. Either you choose the protocol, Philips DVS 3810, or you choose one of the elements you have. Um, I go for, for uh, by protocol equal to, then you can open it up and see all the drivers on there. So can I start typing in there? Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you start typing fill, then you have the Philips DVS 3810. Always use production version. Um, and then you have all the parameters. And our parameter has been renamed to my audio output level. So the my audio output level flows. So I said if it's critical, if it's my main device, and if it's audio output level, then do something. Okay, I will now skip the grouping, I will skip the rule condition, I will go for immediate evaluation, I'll leave everything as it is, the only thing I did is specify a filter, and I scroll down, and I go to my actions, and I add a first action, which is a new alarm, I generate a new alarm, and by default, it is immediately going to uh, suggest you that it's going to generate the new alarm on the base alarm, the raw alarm coming in on that element. Okay, that's going to be my main Philips device. That's perfect. It's going to do it on the base alarm parameter, the audio output level. I'm fine with that. Um, the only thing I have to specify is a value explaining to the operator what is happening, trying to fix the problem. And note, since um, since it is enabling the checkbox here, include name in alarm value, the name of the correlation rule, which is training uh, BERT VA, will be added behind that trying to fix the problem. So I will see that it's my correlation rule doing its thing here and the severity yeah maybe you want to just uh, make this a warning because uh, yeah it's the critical problem we will try to fix it eh? so um, as soon as my audio output level goes critical we try to fix it so we hope it will be successful but you just still want to add a warning there to the operator that he might need to double check if everything was successful. And now we will also play with that auto clear. What I will do is I will just leave it on auto clear for now. And maybe you can already think what will happen. Because my audio output level, if it will go to critical, what will I do? I will generate a warning. Okay. And then my next action will be setting it back to six, setting it back to normal. So actually the condition won't no longer be active. So the auto clear will actually kick in. So I won't hardly see the warning. Let, let's, let's try it out. So the, I generate a warning alarm trying to fix the problem and I add a second action. The second action being set parameter. 
what will I set as a parameter? On which element? Bert IRD main on my device. I will change the my audio output level. My audio output level to a value which is normal and normally six, I believe, should be a normal value. Depends on your alarm template, of course. So I try to fix the problem. I don't need to execute on clear or anything like that. Uh, so I'm, I'm finished. I'm done. Let me just have a quick recap. So I said if it's critical on my Philips device, the audio output level. So if the audio output level goes critical, uh, it will immediately do the actions. Oh, everything in between there, I didn't worry about that. What will it do? It will generate a warning alarm trying to fix the problem and effectively try to fix the problem by setting my audio output level back to six. Okay. If you are finished, you can apply, but what can't we forget? That's making sure that it's enabled, of course. We need to enable our rule and apply again or save again. And only when your rule is in the black font there, it should be working fine. Let me open up a second workspace. I'll leave my correlation rule uh, aside and I go to my IRD main. What I will also do is add an alarm tab page in there linked to cards so that I can see the alarms that I'm generating on my device. Yes, do we have? Let me clear that alarm. If you have any problems with your alarm templates uh, because of uh, exercises you did before and you're not sure anymore, you can always right click on your device, go to protocols and templates, assign the alarm template standards. I still had an auto clear from my exercise uh, earlier. The auto clear should not be enabled on my alarm template. Let's just quickly double check if that's effectively the case. That should be the case. Okay. Okay, uh, I'm ready for a test. I generate an alarm, a critical alarm. What will happen? It will go to uh, 18. Our device is a little bit slow. It goes to 18, it generates the warning alarm, and it says trying to fix the problem. It's doing a set on six, but since it's a little bit delayed, our device, it takes a moment and it goes back to six fully automatically. And my trying to fix the problem alarm has cleared and it's normal because it looks like it takes a couple of seconds at least if you read no it 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 doesn't take a couple of seconds here eh? let me just show you if um the the delay we have here is the delay on our philips device so if we send a command it actually takes uh, quite a few seconds before the device actually adapts. But as soon as we detect the problem, you can already see it's there. So, so there's no delay between those two. And now it already executed the set six, and now it accepted the set six. So let me also show you maybe the information events. So let's do this again, force it on 18. So I did a set to 18. As soon as it will go critical, you will see a set to six. You see? That was on the same moment, you could say, as the alarm was generated at 48, and the alarm was generated here at 48. 
So in the exact same second, it immediately triggered a six, uh, going back to six, but the device is slow. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's our simulation here that is slow. It's actually something in the driver, uh, probably that is uh, causing this delay or maybe that, that, that the timer there that they changed. You would be interested in that time. Is there no way to see it? Then you would uh, probably need to go to the correlation uh, log file. So you can go to the log files there we saw yesterday, uh, go to the correlation log file, and there you would see that an alarm enters, that it's executing the actions, generating an alarm, and doing a set on a parameter. But we're basically talking about milliseconds. It's uh, going to go instantaneously, these things. So you can see if I... Um, yeah, for one another reason, the auto clear is uh, not working here. Um, if we generate an alarm, the device takes a little bit of, it immediately generates, trying to fix it already, send a new command to the device six. The device is a little bit slow to go back to six, but you can see my warning alarm disappears. That is because I had this, let's go back, Auto clear enabled. What happens if I disable the auto clear? Let's apply it and let's test it again. Generate an alarm. If I don't, if I disable that auto clear, it main, means the alarm is there and the trying to fix is there. It's setting the sick, setting it back to 6 dBm. Whenever the device goes back to 6 dBm, there it is. You will see the alarm remains there. So we don't take away the alarm. I disabled that auto clear. So it will stay there forever until an operator comes in here and says like, oh, it was trying to fix the problem. Let's take a look at my, you can also see the device remains in warning. The audio output level remains in warning. I can drill down into the audio output level, into the details. I can see that at 10.14.49, the correlation rule training BERT V was actually changing this parameter. So previously we saw the last change was my name. Now you can see that the correlation actually is doing settings on the equipment. So uh, there you can still investigate what happened, uh, take a look at the trending, etc. Take a look at the alarm details uh, in here. That's the audio output level has been uh, 18 uh, for a few seconds there. So you can all investigate that. And when you're happy, you can right click and you can clear the alarm. It will remain there forever until you clear and then everything is green again. So that's that uh, auto clear uh, that we have. Now I want to also take uh, the next step. And I want to make my correlation rule a little bit wider because I have a dozen of Philips devices and I don't want to create a dozen correlation rules. So I will go back to my correlation rule and I will further enhance it with grouping because I have uh, multiple Philips devices in my training view and I want it to be uh, doing a little bit more on there. So I will do, I will remove that filter equal to Bert main because I want it to be on any Philips device. So I can replace it with, instead of uh, filtering on an element, I will replace it with a filter view and I will actually filter it inside my Bert VA view. I'm not gonna go for the training view because you would otherwise generate alarms and I would trigger on that. So I will still keep it in my site. Um, in my uh, view, I have two Philips devices, the main and the backup. So I'll take it in that section there. So now with one correlation rule, it's taking a look at my complete Philips device uh, on, on my complete uh, view. And let's, let's maybe just as a quick example, show you if I apply that, what will happen now? Because I'm no longer looking at an element. I'm looking at a view with a bunch of Philips devices in there. Let me show you. Um, I will uh, show all the alarms that are happening in my Bert A uh, 
view and I will also open up my backup device in a new card. And I will go for the proportional. The main, I will put the main on the right hand side and the backup on the left hand side. Let me just normalize our situation and also put an arm template standard on that one. Okay, I have a uh, perfectly normal situation now. Uh, I have my main, my main device, my backup device, and I have all the alarms. Uh, of my training view in the bottom. Let me clear that one. Okay, so I have my initial initial situation. So the, the first correlation rule that I uh, did was just on my BERT main device. If an audio alarm happens there, that uh, it goes to uh, into alarm. What I did now is uh, I uh, removed the filter on the element and I replaced it with a view filter. So it means as soon as uh, any Philips device generates an alarm, uh, yeah, maybe I should remove the, trying to fix the problem. What I will do is I will already remove the set parameter so that it doesn't try to fix the problem. So I remove my auto fix. Uh, did it try to auto fix already? Probably. No. Let me start again. Just to make sure that the auto clear there is not interfering. So I removed my uh, set to 6 dBm as well. So now I'm no longer looking at one specific element, but I'm looking at a complete uh, uh, view. So if an alarm happens on a Philips device, clear, clear, clear. If an alarm happens on a Philips device, it's kicking in and it will say trying to fix. Well, actually it's not trying to fix anymore because I removed the auto fix. If a second alarm happens on another Philips device, what will happen? Basically, this alarm is updating and it's now grouping two critical alarms underneath there. So it has my main and my backup underneath there. Why is that? Because I only have one bucket. I now said if a critical alarm happens on a Philips device, on an audio output level, just put it in one big bucket. I didn't create any grouping yet. So I have one correlation group, one correlation rule with some filtering and one big bucket. And that is my one big bucket. My main and my backup is in there already. So how can I avoid that? Because I want to trigger individually on those uh, separate Philips devices. So let's go back to my correlation rule and let's activate some grouping. So underneath the alarm filter, I will add grouping, more specifically group by element. I group by element by adding this single item Let's go back. Yeah, let's maybe just clear everything first again. To start all over again. Clear my alarms. Okay. Okay. I'm starting from scratch again. I'm starting from a completely uh, normal situation. I have no alarms. I have... Uh, my main and my backup device. Let's generate my first alarm. I'll do exactly the same thing as before. But now remember, I not no longer have one big bucket, but I set group by element, meaning it will create a bucket per element. And it won't get it underneath that existing alarm, but it will create a second alarm. There it is for my second uh, bucket. So that's what the grouping is doing. And that's how I can create one correlation rule on my complete system and create a bucket per element. And whenever an element is getting into a certain situation, uh, it will do its actions on there.
OK. Let me just quickly, as an example, add that third step on our event. Uh, let's go back to my uh, correlation rule. What is my third step on my event? So the first thing was a plain, simple filter, very narrow on my Philips device. I made it wider to my view and did some buckets, created some buckets. But now I want to add an extra condition, an extra check on the bucket. And what will that be? I will add a rule condition, more specifically a script condition. I told you where you can find it in the help, so you can search on a uh, script condition. What I will add is uh, count star greater than two. As soon as I have three alarms in my buckets, I will do something. Be careful, you won't be able to generate three alarms critical alarms on your Philips device if you're still filtering on audio output level. So we need to remove our filter item that is filtering on audio output level. Just any critical alarm. So any critical alarm in that view, in buckets of elements, as soon as there are two, uh, three alarms in the buckets, greater than two, so starting from three, it will do something. Let's apply. Let's go to my second workspace. Let's quickly reinitialize my situation here. And also clear my alarms. Okay, so I'm in a perfectly okay condition. So I already created buckets per elements in my previous enhancement. Now I said the bucket needs to contain at least three alarms, critical alarms. So if I generate one alarm, nothing happens. If I generate a second alarm, uh, nothing will happen. I can generate a critical alarm by going to minus 19. So I'm already generating lots and lots of alarms. Nothing is happening. As soon as I will hit three criticals, I'll do that on my main device. As soon as I hit three criticals, you can see it collapses together into a grouped alarm. I say many things are happening on my main device. Let's group it together. And it's grouping it together while well, still without trying to fix the problem. Maybe I should enhance my value there a little bit. Uh, but it's grouping the alarms that are happening if my bucket reaches three critical alarms and I can open up the bucket and I can see I have three alarms left, right, and main and audio operative. And of course, if I would uh, generate a third alarm on my backup device as well, I would also have a bucket for my backup. So those are the two buckets that I have. So the first step was filtering critical alarms on Philips devices on my training view. I keep it in my training view. The second thing is buckets per element. So the two elements have their own buckets. You can see it as well in the alarms. And as soon as the uh, bucket had three alarms, it kicked in and it generated the alarm for that bucket. So every bucket creates its own alarms there. Okay, any questions on our correlation rule that we created uh, on the exercise on... Uh... Could you just, I guess, uh, the question I asked you yesterday, could you, I guess you could um, do a grouping when a specific alarm happens, so for this left test level happens, then do a grouping. If the other two have the alarm, but when the left test level have it, then do the group. Yeah, and that's the example. Um, let's, um, instead of a uh, script condition, let's change it to a filter condition. What you are saying is I want to um, 
trigger my bucket or my bucket needs to kick in if there is a uh, left test level at least a left test level needs to be there uh, so therefore you need to uh, filter on uh, also the parameter description so and uh, i'm going to go again by protocol philips dvs38 then production version the left test level okay and maybe you also want to add critical not major so i'm just going to say if if any alarm well, actually it needs to be critical on top so that's already covered actually so instead of saying my bucket needs to contain three items i say as soon as the left test level is in there group whatever it is so let's apply that let's go back to my alarms and let's do a little bit of clearing clearing uh yes this is six six what does it say a six is not loud oh, yeah it's minus six yeah it needs to be it needs to be minus six or whatever Ooh. minus eight I made a mistake here. Six and eight. Okay. This is a lot of work to clear everything. And here, let's go. All right. So now we have a perfectly normal condition uh, situation again. I changed my buckets check, you could say. Instead of saying if there are three items in there, I said as soon as the left test level is, is in there. I need to do something, meaning that as soon as I generate one alarm on this one, it will immediately kick in. Let's see if I generate a critical alarm on the left test level. It goes into the bucket and immediately the bucket will say, oh, I have a left, left test level. Let's do something and group it. If So I can see the left test level, level is in there. If something new is joining, let's check it out. If the right lef left test right test level uh, comes in it immediately goes into that bucket as well and you can see it's joining the buckets let's take the backup uh, example and let's first generate the alarm on the right test level the right test level goes into alarm it goes into the bucket the bucket says no uh, i don't have any left test level so i'm not doing anything because i have that filter on that bucket so it's standing by there and I can even generate another critical alarm. It won't do anything. It's just letting the system behave as it should behave and generate normal raw alarms. Nothing is happening. I have my two alarms on my backup. And as soon as the left test level also goes into alarm, that bucket will say, oops, there's a left test level problem. Then I need to group everything of that device and I have my backup uh, also doing the grouping alarm there with everything in the bucket. Is there any way to make it more clear than that, that, that the back, bucket the situation is set? Changing maybe, I guess it is, but changing that, making the, the whole alarm row red instead, or just not adding now you're basically only adding the arrow and splitting up the alarm. Uh, to make it more visible that it's a correlated alarm. Um, not immediately. That's the only indication uh, we have. Uh, making it a little bit different, the icon. The background color coding is for all the alarms. So uh, the only thing you can do is um, you can add, in, for instance, an audible alert on only on correlated alarms. Because one of the, the things you can filter on is you have a column or a property that is a source. There it is. So you will see normally it's data miner system, except those special alarms. 
So you could say uh, in uh, Cube, for instance, I'm going to make an audible alert when uh, something like that happens. But apart from that, there's no visual way I can think of immediately. Yeah, just to, well, actually, yeah, the arrow can be there for other alarms as well that have a history. So even worse. So the arrow won't help you to indicate that it's that it's more than one alarm. Um, only uh, if it's, yeah, the special uh, dotted uh, version. But there's no uh, real way of changing something to that uh, in the alarm console. Uh, by doing something in the correlation. Okay, so we did some exercises on our correlation rules. We added a correlation rule uh, as, it, as in the example here, a very simple one with just a filter, uh, specifically on my elements. Then we made it wider to do also on my view, grouped by elements, a bucket per element, and then we added some conditions on that bucket. A count greater than two and greater than two is three, not two. <laughs> and uh, let's take a look at uh, the last items we have to cover for this module. Uh, first of all, there is also a correlation analyzer. What is that thing? Uh, if you right click somewhere on a view, you are able to go to the actions, as you can see here in the screenshots. Uh, so you click on your personal view, you go to actions, analyze. It brings you to the second tab page. We were actually in our first tab page here, correlation rules. Uh, there is also a analyzer tab page. It will automatically create an analyzer that will listen to all the alarms coming from a certain view because you right click on a view or an element. And what basically happens is you can simulate a certain event that you want to uh, trigger upon and maybe unplug a cable, let it generate some alarms and it will detect those alarms. And then once you, uh, well, actually have to click start analyzing first, it listens to all the incoming alarms. So you generate some alarms or you simulate a problem and you click on stop analyzing and it will give you a suggestion here on what kind of correlation rule you might want to add and immediately give you some filters uh, on there. So if you uh, want to have a little bit of help there, you can use that analyzer. Uh, you can play with that one. Uh, so as I said, right click on your view, go to analyzer. It will create one for you. You start. You generate all the alarms you want to generate that it needs to trigger upon. You stop analyzing it and it will give you a, a start for your correlation tool. I'm not going to do an example on that. Uh, you can play with that. Root, root cause analysis. Uh, what is that? Uh, that's something we still need to have a quick look at because that's our third step page in the uh, correlation engine. Uh, so we had uh, a rule, we had our analyzer that I just mentioned and the connectivity editor there. It has a button to launch your connectivity editor. And that's where you can have those connectivity chains. Remember from the demo I gave, um, we do have in our training system some RCA dev devices. So if I search for RCA underscore dev, you will see we have some RCA dev devices and they actually have an RCA level, you can see. And if you want to see the connectivity chain, you can right click on there and you can say view connectivity. It pops up on my first screen and you will see that we have two connectivity chains. Uh, so we have this one and we have the first one. And let's take a look on how to create that. That's with this connectivity editor. So on that third step page, you do have a button uh, that uh, says connectivity editor and you can create a connectivity chain there. How does it work? You're uh, building a connectivity uh, chain. Um, on the very left hand side, you have all the chains that are already created in your system. So we have like maybe 10 chains. If you create or select a chain, you see the details of the chain on the right-hand side. You see the effective chain here. 
here in the middle, you have all the devices in your system. So how will you be able to build a connectivity chain? You will create a new chain and then you just uh, pick and choose the elements uh, from your system from this middle row here. And uh, you just drag and drop them on there, on the builder, you could say, and start connecting them together. I'll do a quick example on that. So you take your uh, devices, you put them on there and you connect them as they are connected. So in this case, if everything would be an alarm, like in our example, the RCA def A, the one on top, would be identified as the probable, most probable root cause. So that's the root cause of the problem because if this device has problems, it will give a bad output and all the other equipment following in the chain will also have alarms, which are all just consequence alarms, you could say. Once we defined our connectivity chain, we can give it a name, we can save it, and there are some options. Two options I have. Uh, the first option I have is, is there, uh, something on here? No. Um, the first option is I have uh, require alarms to occur on the consecutive elements in the chain. Uh, I, it's quite difficult maybe, but uh, what it basically means is what if I have a chain and everything goes into alarm, but again I have some devices that are green in the middle. What do I do with a um, uh, device? that is red again following here. Do I continue counting or is this a new root cause? So if I have a long chain of devices and some of them are uh, in critical in the beginning, then some of them are green and then some of, some of them are critical again, those at the end, do they start from zero again? Is it a new root cause or do you continue counting from the beginning? That what is this option means. Uh, when checked, for the alarms for which none of the parents are in alarm, if they are green uh, uh, before it, it will restart with zero. The second option is just an automatic um, RCA generation on parameters uh, based on time. The first alarm will be the root cause alarm inside the device, and uh, the second alarm will be the second, uh, etc. So that's just based on time, you can define a parameter RCA. How will we be able to link uh, elements? Well, you can uh, link an element by just using the right-click menu and uh, using the link and unlink option in there, but there is actually a more convenient way of doing that, and that is with the um, drag and drop while pressing the control, and that's what I will show you in a demo. So, um, Let's take a look. So the analyzers, those are the analyzers, and I see some people were playing with it. Um, so it was analyzing on the view there. Then you can start analyzing, generate some alarms, and let me stop analyze. I don't know if we generated some alarms. Nope. Sorry, if you were still busy with that. If you want to take a look at it. Uh, so actions, analyze. So it adds an analyzer on my view. Um, so you can apply that and then you can start analyzing. You generate the alarms by generating, uh, let's say I quickly generate an alarm here. Well, quickly. Just one alarm. Okay. Let's go back. If I stop analyzing, yeah, no results found. So I think you guess, you know, I guess you need to have some more uh, items in there. No results, no results, do I have any? Okay, anyhow. The con uh, connectivity editor, uh, there you can... Uh, uh, two windows open. The connectivity editor, I can launch the connectivity editor. It opens up in a new window. As I said, we have some existing chains on the left-hand side. I'm not really worried about that because I will create a brand new one. Um, you can click on File and you can uh, create a new element chain. That's what I will do. You can also go inside 
one device between parameters, basically, the parameter RCA. And you can also insight a, one specific service that's also an element chain or a new service chain. I said you had three numbers. The first one is the service RCA, then we have the element RCA, and then we have the parameter RCA. So that's why you also have uh, three types of uh, connectivity chains. I'll just show you the new element chain. Um, if you want to give it a name, at the bottom you can immediately give it a name, training underscore Bert, Bert VA. And I can uh, filter on there and take some of my Bert equipment. So Bert VA main backup. Uh, yeah, switch doesn't generate alarms. Ah, uh, yeah, yesterday I stopped the Microsoft elements. So your Microsoft elements will be stopped as well because the CPU load was too high on the, our server because of that. Uh, so I can just, uh, well, take a Microsoft anyhow. Uh, you can do multiple selections, just drag and drop them on there. Um, maybe I'll put my, uh, let's say my main and my backup next to each other. And I put my Microsoft on top. How can I connect? You can link and then you need to make all kinds of what is it here that I want to link to what? Uh, so sometimes the right click menu is not uh, that nice uh, to use or that useful to use. So therefore you just want to like link it to each other by doing drag and drop. But if I take this device and if I drag over there, yeah, you're just moving your device. There seems to be some redraw problem here. <laughs> um, you need to do this exactly the same thing while pressing and holding control. So I press and hold control now, and I click and drag on the Microsoft element, and I go to my main device. And you can see there's a blue line to indicate that I will drop it onto that top section. And indeed, I have an arrow going there. If you want to unlink, you need to do it through the right click menu. Be careful if you press and hold control and you drag and drop your device on there, you can drag it, you can drop it on the upper section so that it's on the blue line on top, or you can also drop it actually on the lower section. So be careful where you are with your mouse. If you do it on the lower section, it basically means that the arrow goes the other direction because it actually comes out from the bottom side, you could say, going into this direction. That's not what we want. So we unlink again and we link that one to that one and that one to that one or the other way around. I was mistaken there. Um, but uh, I'm not able to generate alarms on my Microsoft. So what I will do, I will reorganize it and will actually uh, do a link from my main to my backup. My Microsoft is not generating alarms, so that's not really going to be involved here. It's only going to be my main and my backup that is generating alarms. So I linked my main to my backup. If I save that, you will see that your alarms on your data miner system should be updating with uh, an RCA level. You can already see, well, we have our correlation also still kicking in here, of course. But you can immediately see that they are updated because that RCA column is now indicating there. Uh, there is one zero and the other ones are one. The one that is zero, that's my main device. So my main device is in the beginning of the chain. So that one is identified as the root cause in there. Let me clear some alarms as well. In the meantime, to clear it up a little bit, put all my warning correlation alarms. Clear, clear. I cleared some alarms that I just have regular alarms on my main and my backup. So you can see I have two backup problems and I have two uh, main problems. Uh, so you can see the ones that are the two on top or on the backup, they are identified as a consequence alarm. It's number one. It's one hop to the most probable root cause. The other one on the main have a level zero 
and I can right click on my device. I can say view connectivity and on my first screen here, I have my connectivity chain. So that's how you can define a connectivity chain. You can go there, you can pick some elements, you can put them in a chain on going downwards or right hand side, that's the same. Um, and make sure whenever an alarm storm happens, because the first device goes into alarm and it generates a whole bunch of alarms that the operator is able to identify the most probable root cause. Optionally, you can link it to certain uh, parameters, not that important. And we did our linking internal chain, as I said, between parameters, you can also uh, link uh, the parameters to each other, but I'm not going to go into a demo on that. Any questions on RCA? Yes. How many levels can you connect? There's no limit on how many uh, levels. So you mean how many elements you can connect? There's no real limit. I mean, uh, this is, um, it's going to show you whenever you add more items, a scroll bar. So this is just an, a pane where you can just uh, add more and more items to it and there will be a scroll bar. So there is no limitation uh, defined on that. The last item I just briefly want to mention here is we uh, already explained you the aggregation. So I think uh, this is pretty much covered already a little bit, but let me just do a quick recap on that um, to show you what uh, that is about. So aggregation is also part of your uh, correlation. It's not defined in the correlation app. It is defined on a uh, specific uh, view. So you can just uh, go to a view like uh, our root view. Um, on any view, you can just go open up the item, the side panel there, and you can go to the aggregation. And within the aggregation, uh, we can see we have some aggregation rules there. Um, one of the rules we have is our server farm. So you can create folders in there. If you go to the edit mode, you can uh, add a new folder, add a new uh, aggregation rule in there. So we had our um, average, uh, average load in there. What is the average load? The rule is enabled. It has a name, a description. What should be calculated automatically every five minutes, it will calculate the average of the parameter of the Microsoft platform production, the total processor load. And uh, without any condition, so you could add a condition, something like it needs to have a minimum of 16 gigs of RAM. Um, and what will, what will, it, uh, will, will it be applied upon? On the whole tree structure. You can limit it down to a certain tree structure. So that means that uh, for every uh, view that has Microsoft elements, so maybe I should start mine again. And start my Microsofts again. It will show you the average uh, CPU load that we have in there. In this case, this parameter is also being uh, alarmed upon and there is also trending activated. So you can uh, create rules very easily, give it a name and calculate certain averages, but also some min, max uh, counts is uh, possible. Let's go to my BERT VA view. And it's not initialized yet. It will take some time before uh, my average load will be executed or executing. So let me show it in our Europe view. So in the Europe view, you can see the average load is 9%, meaning for all my servers in Europe, I maybe have 100 servers, the average CPU load is 9%. And I can drill down and I can take a look in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, it's also 9% because it's actually the same server. <laughs> There's only one server. And I can take a look in Brussels, 
And in Brussels, apparently we don't have any servers. In London, we don't have any. In our training, let's see if something already pops up in the training. No, not yet. So uh, also in the USA, it's nine because it's the same server. It's added in multiple uh, items. Remember the example I gave on the HFC network there? We had in uh, Mexico an example where we had the different regions and cities and it did a count of all the cable modems uh, online or offline for a certain region. And remember, this parameter is being monitored. So here, I'm able to generate an alarm on a view. So it's perfectly possible that all my servers are green and still the combination of all the servers, the average or the sum of the count, is generating an alarm. And that's perfectly possible with uh, something like the CPU load. Eh? The CPU load, maybe you're only generating when it's at 100% an alarm on a specific server, but if my average load of the, the data center is getting to 80%, I need to add some capacity. So that's where you can uh, create those uh, correlation rules. Uh, I already uh, explained that a little bit, so that was a, a quick recap uh, on how to do that.